I look forward to what you have to say. Thanks, Gary. So uh, today's research rounds is brought to us by uh, the Ocean, which I think most of you have heard of by now, but uh, this is the Developmental Origins of Chronic Disease in Children Network. Um, so it's a new research cluster here at Kern. And um, so on that theme, I'm going to talk about early life breathing and lung health in adolescents. Um, so the network has really been developed to look at how chronic diseases start in early life, but this study is a one example of that kind of research going on here. So Terry just mentioned getting new papers written, so the um, findings I'm sharing with you today actually are a paper that's coming out in a couple of weeks in geography ethics. And so um, in addition to myself, Alan Becker is um, a lead, uh, leader author of this paper, as Terry alluded to, um, and the papers are listed here. Uh, so to start off with, developmental origins. This is the theme of the Devotion Network. It's also the theme of my research program. And so this is a theory that um, started in the 1980s and it was originally referred to as the fetal programming hypothesis or the Barker hypothesis after David Barker first developed it. And so it was the idea that exposures or events happening uh, during fetal development could have a really long-term impact on health. Um, more recently, this theory has evolved and it's now known as the developmental origins of health and disease or DOPA hypothesis. And the evolution is to recognize that it's uh, not only fetal development that's critically important, but also um, the early postnatal period. So exposures happening uh, during gestation and also during early life can have a long-term uh, impact on health. So in my research program, I'm interested in the developmental origins of a variety of diseases, so including allergies, asthma, and obesity. These are the main chronic disorders of childhood. And so for today, I'll focus on um, asthma. Um, so developmental origins research requires um, research at a variety of levels. So at the population level, um, and this is really where the hypothesis started. So David Barker identified associations between birth weight and um, coronary heart disease in adults, and he did this looking at um, population level data. We also need clinical research, um, and pregnancy cohorts are especially important here because we need to be able to study in detail what's happening during pregnancy and then throughout the life course. And this is the level of detail that we don't get from population level surveys. Um, and then we also need basic science to get into the mechanisms behind these associations that we identify at the population level or clinical cohort. Um, so again, the devotion network really brings all of these together with investigators from each of these domains. Um, and so today, I'm going to focus on some cohort research that I've been involved in. Um, so starting out, though, I'll tell you about two other cohorts that um, sort of inspired this study. So first is the Tucson Children's Respiratory Study, or PCRF. This was a cohort in the United States of children born in the 1980s. There's about 1,200 of them. Um, and in a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, this group was the first to identify four leading phenotypes in early life. So um, it's fuzzy because it's an old paper, um, but I wanted to show the original. Um, so they identified never leaving, transient early leasing, late onset leasing, and persistent leasing. And these were what we call investigator-defined phenotypes. So they were based on what the investigators thought might be important phenotypes, and they classified the children into these categories. So never wheezing would be no wheezing throughout early childhood. Um, and they looked at um, primarily at age three and age six. So if there was no wheezing at either age, you would classify this as a never wheezer. Um, if a child wheezed before age three, but not anymore at age six, that would be a transient early wheeze. Um, late onset would be no early wheezing in, or no wheezing in early life, but then wheezing by age six, and persistent would be wheezing throughout. So these are four sort of phenotypes um, that were defined in the cohort. And then later on in a second publication, when they followed up these children at age 16, they looked at whether these phenotypes um, predicted outcomes in adolescence. So how meaningful um, were these early leaving events? And what you can see here is they found that for skin test reactivity, so a marker of allergic sensitization, um, they found that the children who were wheezing actually in any of the phenotypes had a stronger likelihood of being skin test positive at 16 years of age. And this was highest amongst the persistent users. And then on the far side, um, this is a measure of lung function. And so you can see that for all of the wheezing children, um, there was a deficit in lung function um, at 16 years of age. So these early wheezing phenotypes seem to um, be important for long-term respiratory health and allergic disease. Um, so a second cohort uh, called the ELSPAC cohort 
is from the United Kingdom, and these were children born in the early 90s. It's a larger cohort, so there's about 6,000. Um, and in this cohort, they used a different method to classify weasel uh, phenotypes, and we call these data-defined instead of investigator-defined. So uh, rather than classifying into sort of uh, categories that the investigators thought would be important, they let the data do the classifying for them. Um, so they used a statistical method called latent class analysis, and they identified um, actually six weasel phenotypes. And they've graphed them out here, so you can see in green, these would be the never weasers. Um, this is age in months from six months out to 81 months of age. So they had never weasers. Um, they still had a transient burden, so um, that would be the one in uh, blue, so they're weaving, but then not later on. Um, they have the persistent weasers, so the red, who are weaving all throughout. And then they had a couple of in-between phenotypes, so intermediate weaving um, and prolonged early weaving. Um, and again, they also studied whether or not these early weaving phenotypes had um, an important effect on um, later life disease. And so we only went out to age seven, so it's a bit of a younger cohort. But here they found that um, for physician-diagnosed asthma, there was a strong increase in risk of asthma with any one of these weaving phenotypes. And there's sort of a gradient where uh, transient early weaving is associated with a two-fold increased risk of asthma, all the way up to the persistent weaving has a 300-fold increased risk of asthma, so huge. Um, and so this was shown for asthma, and then again they looked at um, ATP or uh, early sign of allergy, and again saw an association, not as strong as for asthma, but they saw that this was important. Um, so both of these cohorts uh, demonstrate, or the evidence we've shown you, demonstrate that patterns of early weaving during early childhood are associated with different long-term prognosis for respiratory allergic disease. Um, so both of the cohorts that I've just shown you are general population cohorts, meaning that they were um, recruited general healthy pregnant women. Um, and so the first one, the Tucson cohort, looked at ATP and lung function all the way up to age 16. Uh, the ALSPAT cohort, um, which is a bit younger, looked at ATP and asthma up to age 7. Um, so but the question that we had was whether or not these phenotypes and associations apply to high risk children um, and to diagnose disease in adolescents. So um, both of these are general population cohorts. We wondered about high-risk children, so children born into families with a genetic history, history of allergic disease. Um, and then also diagnosed disease is important. So um, the Tucson study went out to age 16, but they looked at lung function and ATP as opposed to diagnosed disease. Um, and the ALSPAC did look at diagnosed asthma, but only out to age 7. Um, so our questions then were in high-risk children, uh, firstly, what is the distribution of these phenotypes? Does it look different in the general population? Secondly, um, what are the risk factors for these early weas phenotypes? And thirdly, do the phenotypes predict clinical disease in adolescents? Um, so to answer these questions, we used um, the Canadian Asthma Primary Prevention Study cohort. So many of you have heard me speak about the child study. Today I'm telling you about a different study. Um, so this one is a cohort of 545 high-risk infants born in 1995, about half here in Manitoba and half at the University of British Columbia, or in BC. Um, and so they were high-risk, meaning that they had a first-degree relative with allergy or asthma. Um, and they were recruited, uh, pregnant women were recruited during pregnancy, and they were randomized to an intervention. So this was actually an intervention study um, where the investigators were aiming to prevent asthma development in these high-risk children. So uh, what I'll tell you about today isn't really focused on the intervention, but those results have been published out of the um, the intervention, though, involved things like avoiding um, tobacco smoke in the home, uh, breastfeeding as long as possible, um, and a few other recommendations. Um, and then the, the, the cohort has been followed up. Um, so since birth, they've been followed at one year, two years, seven years, and then most recently at age 15. And some of the team responsible for that great research is here. Um, so for today, um, we're interested in the weaving phenotypes. So uh, the clinical follow-ups, as I just said, were 1, 2, 7, and 15 years. But there were questionnaires um, more frequently than that. So parents answered questionnaires at 4, 8, 12, 18, and 24 months. And again, at the seven-year follow-up. Um, and they reported on wheezing. So we're able to classify the children then into the four categories of never wheezing, transient early, late onset, or persistent wheezing. So this is the, the four Tucson phenotypes. Um, there's a slight difference where the Tucson cohort used two and uh, seven years, and we have data for, oh, they used three and six years, as was shown here, but we have two and seven years. So it's a bit different, but similar. Um, 
So the outcomes that we looked at in the CATS cohort at 15 years of age <coughs> were diagnosed asthma, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, and food allergy. So these were all done by standardized physician diagnosis, um, either by a physician here in Manitoba or out at the University of uh, British Columbia. We also looked at ATP, so the skin testing for allergic sensitization. Well, we looked at lung function, so spirometry, um, and the measure I'm showing you here today is FEV1, or forced expiratory volume in one second. We looked at airway hyperresponsiveness, so this is also assessed by spirometry with a methacholine challenge. Um, and we looked at wheeze by self-report, so by this time the, the children are 15 years old, so they could report that themselves. Um, so the results. Uh, this first is just giving you a snapshot of the cohort. So these are the 459 children where we had complete news data. And so you can see um, that almost three quarters had a maternal history of allergic disease. And so that was a requirement for being in the cohort, right, was having a first degree relative. So in many cases, it was the mother. Um, you can see about 50% of the children were exclusively breastfed for more than four months. Um, almost half were firstborn infants. There was about a third of the families having pets in the home. Um, about a fifth had smoking in the home. So remember, this is back in 1985. Um, and three quarters of the moms had a post-secondary education. <coughs> so this is how it looked when we classified the phenotypes uh, for wheezing. So you can see in CAPS, and I've compared it to the Tucson cohort alongside, but so in CAPS, um, similar to in Tucson, actually about half of the children never wheezed at any point from before seven years of age. In CAPS, we had about a quarter that were transient early wheezers, so they had documented wheezing before two years of age, but then um, were not wheezing anymore by age seven. Um, and this was slightly more compared to the Tucson cohort. Um, and then for late onset, we had just under 10%, and about 13% uh, with persistent wheezing all the way through uh, early life. So this was a significantly different distribution compared to Tucson, which may be because of the different uh, environments of these two cohorts, uh, the different allergic disease family history, or perhaps the different definitions that we used with a slight age difference. But, um, so the next question was about risk factors. So these are some of the risk factors we looked at. <coughs> looking at what factors in early life are um, associated with the classification of, of these phenotypes. So we saw more wheezing in boys, and this was expected. This has been shown in other studies. Um, and so you can see that in the first row. Um, we saw also more wheezing in the children living in Winnipeg versus Vancouver. Um, we saw, not statistically significant if you look across the four phenotypes, but if you just looked at persistent wheezing, the difference um, is significant where there's less wheezing in the intervention group. So if you remember, this was an intervention study. Um, so it looks like intervention had an effect on reduced wheezing. Um, we saw no association with maternal atopy. Uh, we did see uh, more wheezing with, uh, in moms with a lower education. Um, no difference of, according to pets or smokers in the home. Um, we saw less wheezing among children who were exclusively breastfed for four months or longer. Um, and the most uh, strongest association, which is right at the bottom, is atopy. So at the two-year clinical assessment and also at the one year for CAPS, uh, skin testing was done uh, to classify infants as allergic sensitized or not. And that was the single biggest risk factor for having wheezing um, in early life was whether they were allergic sensitized. Um, and so as I mentioned, we saw less wheezing in the intervention group and less wheezing in the exclusive recipe. So moving to the outcomes then. Um, this is uh, a clinical outcomes that I mentioned earlier and showing you the crude prevalence of each of them at 15 years of age according to wheeze phenotype. So in black, we have the, never, the children who are never wheezing. And you can see that in almost every case, they have the lowest rates of allergic <coughs> and airway disease. Um, and then in green, we have the transient early. Orange is the late onset and red is persistent. And so um, particularly for the respiratory outcomes, so wheeze and asthma, you can see um, a really obvious gradient where the never wheezers have the lowest rates. Um, there's an increase if there was transient early wheezing, a further increase with um, late onset, and this, the highest percent of um, wheezing and asthma was in the children with persistent wheezing in early life. So um, this was really clear for wheezing, for asthma, for airway hyperresponsiveness. But you'll notice there's no clear pattern for the allergic um, outcomes. So A to P, allergic rhinitis, food allergy, um, and somewhere with atopic dermatitis. So these are crude rates. Um, they're not adjusted, but 
we had to, since we found that there were significant associations with uh, things like breastfeeding and ATP, we wanted to control for those in our analysis. And also it was really important to control for the fact that this was an intervention study. Um, so here what you're seeing is the results after we've uh, adjusted for the intervention group, um, also sex, city of residence, and breastfeeding, so, and ATP, since those were the strongest um, factors associated with the weaning phenotypes. Um, and so what this table is showing, the odds ratios that are highlighted in red are the ones that are still, still significant after this adjustment. Um, and they're actually very strongly significant. So for asthma in particular, so the second row, what you can see is that children who wheezed, uh, had early transient wheezing in early life had almost a four-fold increased risk of asthma by age 15. Um, and if they had late onset wheezing, they had a six-fold increased risk. And if they had persistent wheezing, they had almost a 12-fold increased risk. So those are really large effect sizes, and they were strongly significant after accounting for all the um, important <coughs> Uh, we saw this also for wheeze, um, also for airway hyperresponsiveness, um, but for the ATP endocarditis, atopic dermatitis, uh, we didn't see an association that's similar to the graph I showed you on the last slide. Um, we also looked at lung function. So here, um, these graphs are both looking at forced expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1. Um, these are the rates before adjusting for any other factors. On the left is um, the raw value. So, uh, and then on the right is the corrected for percent predicted value. So this is where we compare to what we'd expect for a child of that age of sex. Um, and they show similar patterns, but they're even more obvious when we correct for age of sex. And so what you can see is that there's a decline in lung function um, for all of the wheezing children, but especially for those that were wheezing persistently in early life. So again, new row comes at 15, according to the early life wheezing. Um, and so, again, we want to correct for the intervention study design and also for some other risk factors. And when we do that, we still see significant deficits in lung function, um, especially for the persistent wheezers. So um, the early transient uh, wheezing children had a 5% reduction in percent predicted um, lung uh, function. Um, and the persistent wheezers had almost a 10% uh, percent reduction in lung function. So to summarize those results, um, this is the slide I showed you earlier after summarizing the Tucson and Alsbach um, data. So they were general population cohorts, um, and they looked at ATP lung function and asthma, and our question was whether or not this um, applied to high-risk children and diagnosed disease. So in the CAPS cohort, we were able to look at this population of high-risk infants, um, and we were able to address lung function, allergic disease, and asthma. And so these were our three questions. And so the first one being the distribution. So we saw that the distribution was somewhat different compared to the general population cohort in Tucson. Um, and I got a star there reminding me to acknowledge that the definitions were different, so the environments are also different. Um, but we saw a relatively similar distribution. And the second question was about the risk factors. So I showed you that male sex was a risk factor for reading, living in Winnipeg, apparently, um, and also very strongly being um, sensitized before ages, before age one or two. Um, and then we saw that protective factors included potentially the past intervention, as well as exclusive breastfeeding. Um, and then, so the big question is whether or not this predicts clinical outcomes. And so we did see a strong gradient across the wheezing phenotypes for decreased lung function. So this again is a summary of the percent deficit in lung function across those three phenotypes. And we also saw a strong increased risk of asthma across these phenotypes with um, essentially four, six, and 12-fold increased risk um, in the transient early late onset of persistent diseases. We didn't see any difference in the topic disease outcomes. <coughs> so to summarize this in sort of a visual format, um, we saw that ATP before two years of age was the single strongest risk factor for wheezing in early childhood. So it was about a two-fold risk and it was strong and significant. Um, we then saw that persistent wheezing was an extremely strong risk factor for asthma in adolescents with more than 11-fold increased risk. Um, so I think an important question then is what early interventions can we think of to reduce either early ATP or um, childhood wheezing and what effect might this have on asthma? And if this is a pathway uh, that's causal, then we would hypothesize that reducing ATP in early life or reducing early wheezing could have a really big impact on preventing asthma. And so some of the interventions um, that might be uh, 
effective based on the data in our study would be the CAPS intervention, so this multifaceted intervention that starts during pregnancy. Um, and also, in particular, we see evidence that breastfeeding uh, is a strong protective factor against early leaving. Um, and maybe there are others. Um, and I put an extra arrow here to reflect the fact that um, maybe we want to intervene even before infancy um, and early childhood because that can have a really strong effect. And that's really the whole concept of devotion is for us to look at what are the early life factors for chronic disease and how can we intervene to prevent at that critical stage of development. Um, so I think the take home messages first are that early childhood wheezing patterns do predict respiratory function and asthma risk in adolescents. So another way of saying that is that asthma associated lung function deficits are already present at a really young age. So we're seeing in children that are 15 with asthma, looking back to when they were babies, we could already identify these deficits um, in very early life. And so <coughs> it follows then that interventions to reduce early weeping and atopic sensitization could have really long-term health benefits. So some of the limitations to acknowledge in this study, firstly, is that we cannot uh, assess the LSPAC these phenotypes. So I showed you the four Tucson phenotypes, and then I showed you the fancy diagram with um, the six these phenotypes. We were able to address those because they required data in that intermediate time zone between two and seven years of age, and we didn't have a follow-up in that period, so we couldn't look at them. Um, we also couldn't do latent class analysis, and this was not for lack of trying. So I did try with our data to let the data do the classification uh, for us, uh, but we had a relatively small end. So if you remember, the Alphabet cohort was over 6,000 children, and we had um, about 400, uh, 4 to 500 in cats with complete. <coughs> so it wasn't really feasible to do that type of analysis. Um, and then finally, um, a question is uh, about the risk factors. So these data are showing us that early wheezing is really important, um, as well as early atopy. And so what are the risk factors influencing the development of those phenotypes, and how can we potentially intervene? So we looked at a few. So breastfeeding was one. Um, I showed you that male sex and living in Winnipeg were risk factors. Those aren't things we can do much about. Um, but looking um, in more detail at the genetics and the environment, some of this has been explored in the CAPS study. There's, I think, over 30 papers actually published out of CAPS already, so they've done GWAS analysis as part of larger cohorts, um, and they've looked at the environment. Um, but I think these are questions to keep in mind in, in future cohort studies. So I said I wouldn't talk about the child study, but I have one slide. Um, so this, of course, is a newer cohort that, uh, that we're a part of. <coughs> so it's a national study. Um, it has 3,600 children, so a larger number. So potentially we'll have the ability to do these kind of latent class analyses um, and look at more than four phenotypes if they do exist. Um, this is a national study, uh, and we're looking really in detail at genetic and environmental exposure. So um, we've done home assessments for all of the families. Um, we've collected loads of data on uh, maternal nutrition, stress, all of these um, factors that potentially could be influencing early sensitization and early wheezing on the path to asthma. Um, we also have bio biological samples that let us look in detail at the mechanisms involved. Um, and we have follow-up so far to age five, so it'll be a while before I'm telling you about the 15-year-old kids from the child cohort, but I hope to be doing that today. Um, and so we are following asthma as one of the main outcomes, allergy and other chronic diseases. Um, so I want to acknowledge all the people involved in this research. So in my lab, Amy Dittnerski is not here today, but she um, was really helpful in uh, writing up this paper, getting it all analyzed and uh, submitted. Also, the CAPS team, many of whom are here in the audience. So it's been a, cohort studies are an enormous amount of work. Um, I have a great team ensuring that all the data get collected and all the families stay engaged and involved. Um, and that includes a team here in Manitoba, but also one in BC. Um, and I want to thank uh, Devotion for asking me to speak today and uh, the funders for this research. So thanks very much.